Hello Saints, welcome back to Increase in Talents. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahshua, God's salvation. Okay, I hope y'all were blessed by the teaching on the fruit. That was the first step into the Garden of Eden. Um, we're going completely in today. We're going to be unraveling the meaning of some things hidden in the Garden and the clues that were left to us, even from the New Testament. It's funny how God hides clues all through the Bible to take us back to understand these deeper things of God. And one of the clues that was given was so hidden that, I mean, centuries people have read over something that Jesus did and have even argued and discussed it and didn't even realize that Jesus was leaving us a clue. Okay? You remember when Jesus healed, healed that blind man? And I've heard it taught. This is, this is how I've heard it taught in churches. Even sometimes Jesus has to touch somebody twice to heal them, meaning he didn't heal them completely. And they utilize this so when people go up to the altar and they don't get healed, they tell them, don't worry, even Jesus tried to heal a man once and it took a while before the healing took place. No! <laughs> Jesus, if Jesus wants to heal somebody, all he does is touch them and they're healed. What Jesus did was lead a clue. He left a clue to the believers for us to understand something that took place in the garden. He was literally leaving a key, a key to open up a door that was going to lead us into the garden. Okay, we got one key, which was the fruit is the speaking out of our mouths, the fruit of our lips is um, what they ate from the two trees. So that brings us to the understanding now, if the fruit of the lips is what they ate from the tree, trees don't have no lips. So if the fruit is spoken words, then what in the world was the tree? I know many of you that watched the video were thinking, well, if the fruit is spoken words, then what is the tree? Jesus left us a clue. Turn your Bibles to Mark 8 and 22 and 24. And it reads, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. I see men as trees walking. Let me reiterate. God scattered knowledge all over the Bible. The Bible identifies that it is a coded book. It tells us it's a coded book. God hid things in metaphors and in the meaning of names and just scriptures that are out of place, it seems, out of context, when there literally are pieces of a puzzle that gives us a key understanding or gives us a wisdom and knowledge of things that are taking place in the Bible. So we're, here we are where Jesus takes this blind man out of the city and then he lays hands on him, spits in his eyes and put his hands upon him. And he asks him, well, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees walking. And it was a clue. It was a clue. After the Holy Spirit gave me the revelation on the fruit, he gave me a while to meditate on what he showed me. And it came to me after that, well, if the fruit is spoken words, then what is the tree? And it took me a little longer. It took me a while before God started opening up my understanding. You know, it's like the, the thing about the fruit was there simmering. It was setting in. I was starting to get all the nuances of what it meant and seeing it all over the scripture. And then after that was done, he started taking me into the tree. And this was the verse that he led me to in Matthew, where I had to ask the question, why did 
Jesus have to touch the man twice before he was healed. I was reading Mark 8, 22 and 24, and I asked myself a simple question. Why did Christ have to go through all that to heal the blind man? I mean, he walked him outside the city, spit in his eyes, put his hands on him, <coughs> yet he still didn't see clearly. Finally, Christ touched his eyes, and then he saw clearly. Because the next verse reads, Mark 8 and 25, After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. When you spend a lot of time in the Word of God, you start to get a feel of how God does things. Anytime God takes you through a process when he or the son are doing something, then there is hidden knowledge in what is being done. All Christ had to do was say, be healed. As he has done on other occasions in scripture. And the man would have been healed. He did it the way he did for a reason. Christ does not have to touch you twice to heal you. He was leaving us a clue of understanding. Let's look at another blind man that he healed. Let's look at John 9, 6-7. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, you have to understand, for people that don't know Scripture, that don't spend their time in Scripture, you will read this and you think, well, this is the norm. But for, for us that spend time in Scripture, we know there was a time where a man came to Jesus and said, look, my people's at the house. They, 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 they about to die. You know, could you please come and, and um, could you please heal them? And Jesus said, come on, let's go heal. And the man said, look, I know who you are. You can just speak it and the person be healed. And Jesus said, great is your faith, and he spoke it. And when the person went home and asked, well, what time was the person healed? And they said, well, it's like 2 o'clock, and it was the same time that he was speaking to Jesus. So Jesus did not need to lay hands on someone to heal him. He don't even have to be there. So for him to do something that is a, such a process of spitting on the ground, you know, and then taking clay or the dirt from the ground and mixing it with the spit, and then anointing it on the eyes of the blind person and telling them to go to this specific pool and wash their, 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 themselves in the pool and then they come back and they're healed it's not a magic trick it's something that he's trying to teach The interpretation of what Christ did is well known, so I, I will not go into details. I'll just give it. The spit represents the word of God coming forth from the Father and mixing it with the clay. Is a metaphor for the word of God mixing with the flesh. That is Christ coming forth from the Father and becoming a man or putting on flesh. He anointed the man's eyes with the clay and spittle or spit mixed which represents the blind unbeliever encountering Christ and believing. The blind man, believer, represented as the believer, then goes to a pool named Sent. The name of the pool is Sent, which represents the Holy Spirit that was sent from God. He goes into the pool, which represents us being baptized into the body of Christ, and finally he came back seeing this healing is not the same process as Christ took with the first man he was revealing something different Christ does not have to touch you twice to heal you he wanted the man to see the trees it was all about the trees Christ took him out of the town to give him away from the un get him away from the unbelievers if Christ would have opened up his eyes into the spirit realm in town Lord knows what he might have seen 
When Christ took him apart from the town, the only ones there would have been the disciples and angels. Christ did not half heal the man as some teach. He gave him a glimpse into the spirit realm. He saw the trees that God had planted walking as men. Christ did this on purpose because it is a key to understand what or who the trees in the garden really are. With the blind man, we have one man that saw both realms, spiritual and natural. But we're going to go and take a look at two men who saw one of each realm and do a comparison. Now before we do that, let's reiterate. He wanted the man to see into the spiritual realm. So he, he anointed him and he laid hands on him and he asked him, what do you see? And he replied, I see men as trees walking. And then he touched them again and it says he saw clearly. But we have to remember that God, Jesus can heal any way he wants. But he does not have to go through that process. But he wanted this man to see something. And he wanted him to speak it. And it was left as a clue in the Bible for us to understand. Men as trees walking. Men as trees walking. Alright. Let's take a look at two men. One of the men is Daniel. The other man is John. This blind man just saw the spiritual realm and the natural realm. And I'm going to show you so you understand how he saw the spiritual realm and the natural realm. But now we're going to see Daniel who is going to see the natural realm. And then we're going to see John taken up in the spirit and a vision who's going to be shown the spiritual realm. And both of them are going to get revelation, but the real revelation in both of their stories is that they're looking at the same thing. Let's go. Okay, so the angel Gabriel has taken Daniel in a vision to the bank of a river. As he stands with him, Daniel describes what he is seeing. Please pay attention to the men and their location on the river. I'm going to say that again. Pay attention to the men and their location on the river. There's a little, I, I, want, I don't want to say it's a trick. There's a little, a little something hidden there that you, if you don't read it clearly, you're going to miss. Guys, I want you to please notice exactly what it says in the prophecy in Daniel before we get to the main part okay look at Daniel 12 4 but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased so God is literally telling Daniel to seal the book Write it in metaphors. Make it so it cannot be understood until the time of the end. But then he's saying knowledge is going to increase. And he's not talking about, people like to say that this is talking about, you know, um, like technology or man being and smarter. But what God is talking about is the knowledge of the spiritual things. The knowledge of biblical things is going to increase. And then at the time of the end, everything is going to be released. And people are going to start understanding scripture. And it's the time that's going to unction in the coming of the Lord. And this is the time that we're living in right now because these hidden things are being revealed. All right, this is Daniel 12 verses 5 to 7. And it reads, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. The one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the water of the river, How long will it be to the end of these wonders? 
And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and and half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Daniel is seeing an angel who appears as a man. Okay? And he's on the side of a riverbank where Daniel is standing. And he's talking to this angel. Okay? Now, as he looks across the river, on the other side, he sees another man, another angel, standing there. And then, that when he asks the question, the angel that is standing next to him goes and speaks to the angel that is standing in the middle of the river. He's standing on the water. So you have one angel on his side of the river, another angel on the other side of the river, and another angel standing in the middle of the river. Okay? Now, let's compare this to what John saw in Revelations. Revelation 22, 1 to 2. And it reads, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bear twelve manner of fruits, and yield her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. John saw a river of pure water coming from the throne of God. I told you before that God hides things in plain view. Over the years while ministering, I have asked many believers how many trees they see in those two verses. Very few people have seen the correct number. Let me explain what, the, what throws people off. You see the word street in verse 2. It is not a street like a road. The Greek word translated street is platea. It just means a wide open space. The previous chapter is speaking about the city, New Jerusalem. When people see the word street in the chapter, their minds automatically see it as a street in the city. If you read the beginning of verse 2 carefully, you will see John is talking about an open space in the middle of the river. Rivers do not have streets. When I ask people how many trees of life John sees, the majority say one and some say two. The truth of the matter is that is wrong. I want you to stop the video and go back to the verses and read them again and tell me how many trees does John see? Just read it carefully and tell me how many trees does John see? Go ahead. The truth of the matter is there are three. One tree is in the open space in the middle of the river. One tree is on each side of the river, equaling two. The total adds up to three trees. Daniel and John are at the same river. Daniel saw angels and John saw trees of life. Yet the truth is, what they saw represent one and the same. Now we understand why what Christ did with the blind man becomes so important because it brings the two together. The blind man saw men as trees walking. John saw trees, Daniel saw the angels. Okay? Men as trees walking is the catalyst to understanding that men and angels are represented as trees in the Bible. When the Bible talks about men and angels, the metaphor of trees is often used. 
Now, if what I'm saying is the truth, there's going to be other scriptures that are going to identify this. It should be in this. Remember, we, we put precept on precept, line, line, here a little, there a little. So if what I'm saying is true, then we should be able to find other places in the Bible where God is talking about men or angels, but he calls them trees. Let's take a look. Psalms 1, 1 to 3, and it reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree, Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Do you notice that that sounds a lot like Revelation? The trees that bring forth their fruit in season? And the leaf for the healing of the nations. Let me read verse 3 again. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. These are trees planted by the river. But the beginning of the verse says, blessed is a man. So they're talking about men. But they're using the metaphor of we being trees planted by the river of life. That verse should sound familiar. Fruit in season leaves that do not wither are metaphors. Let's go back to Revelation and do a comparison. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manners of fruit. Fruit in its season, and yield her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. If you take Psalms 1, 2, and 3 and put it together, excuse me, Psalms 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, and put it together with Revelation 22 and 2, you start getting an understanding because you're putting the precept on precept, you're tying them together, and it's giving you a greater revelation an understanding. The Word of God is a seed. You are the dirt that it's planted in. And the seed of the Word of God comes from the tree of life. That seed is going to start growing. It becomes a tree that's growing up in you. And then as you mature as a tree, you start speaking Fruits of the lips. What are you speaking? You're, tr you're speaking fruits of life. You're speaking knowledge and wisdom of life because you have become a tree of life because that word was implanted in you, the dirt which you are as a metaphor, and now it is growing up and it's becoming a tree. And it is planted by the rivers of water, which means the Holy Spirit. That's why the leaves don't wither. Because it's planted next to the river of life. The Holy Spirit is flowing. And this water, you remember Jesus said, out of thy belly will come rivers of living water. Why? Because you are the tree that's planted by the river of life. You are the tree that the Holy Spirit is flowing through, is speaking through. And your lips produce fruits of life that others come and they, they eat and ingest and then the seed of life is implanted in them. And it continues on and on and on as long as you are planted next to the river. You are the tree of life. You become a tree of life. Look at Proverbs 11 and verse 30. Proverbs 11 and verse 30 and it reads, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. Saints, do you see how the things are connecting now? You see how the tree of life and the fruit that's being spoken is connecting? And now you realize the trees, the two trees in the garden were not two literal trees, but they were metaphors hiding what actually happened in the garden. And, and it's a reason they're being hidden. We're going to get into that. but We're going there. 
But let's just take a little time and let's absorb what we're learning right now. The fruit of the lips is the fruit that's produced by trees of life. The word of God is implanted in your heart. You're the dirt that it's implanted in. And when it starts growing and bearing fruit, it's the fruit of life. You're speaking the, the, these words of life. The word of God is coming out of you. It's living waters, but it's also fruit of your lips that are implanted in unbelievers. And if they allow this tree to be planted by the rivers of water and nourished and grows up, it's going to produce fruit too. It's the process that's hidden in this wisdom and knowledge. The righteous angels are trees of life. Righteous saints become trees of life. There is also a special tree of life which sits in the God's garden and gives eternal life. Christ gave us the proper name for the garden planted at the east of Eden and, the, and specify that those who overcome in this life will have access to this tree of life. Revelation 2 and verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The Garden of Eden is the paradise of God. And for all us saints that overcometh, we have to overcome. That's something that in today's church they're trying to put to the side. Nobody will want to read that part. You have to overcome. And guess what? It's not overcoming because you confess Christ. It's overcoming because this war, this struggle that you're in against sin, against the forces of evil, you have to overcome. And God has given us everything we need. We have the armor of God. So we have everything we need to overcome. We just have to know how to utilize it. We have to know the truth of what the word of God is saying. And then we have to walk on the king's highway. We have to walk on that road of holiness and become overcomers. And as the scripture says, he that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, let's reiterate what we have learned so far. We have learned that the Bible is a coded book in many sections. We have learned that it contains dark sayings and parables that we are able to understand by unraveling metaphors. We have learned that we have to put pieces of the puzzles together for different, from different areas of the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit, precept on precept. We have learned that the fruit mentioned in the garden was spoken words that Eve embraced and shared with Adam, who accepted them. We have learned that the trees are metaphors for angels and people. So now we understand what the tree of life is. Okay? And we understand that everybody that accepts the word of God has a tree of life planted in them. Now, if you know anything about trees, you know just because you plant a seed doesn't mean that that tree is going to one day bear fruit. A lot of obstacles are going to come to that tree. You got disease, you got insects, you got drought, you got people coming to chop it down. So the, 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 the caretaker of the area has to be the one to take care of that tree, to, to water that tree, nourish that tree. To make sure it receives everything that it needs to grow and to produce fruit. You're the caretaker. A lot of people want to say, well, no, it's Jesus. It's, 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 it's Jesus is doing everything. No, 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 no. You better go read them scriptures. Okay? Read the, um, the parable of the sower where, where Christ talks about seeds planted in different areas and the different outcomes of those seeds that are planted. Okay? We are the ones that are required to position ourselves to make sure that that seed is planted in fertile ground and then to protect the seed, to allow it to grow, to allow it to prosper, and keep it, keeping it planted next to the river of water, which is connected to the Holy Spirit. We have a part in this. The natural process that God has placed in his word will fulfill what it was given to do. But we still have to protect its location and the environment to make sure that it reaches its full potential. That is our requirement. Okay, so if we know that the two trees in the garden 
was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now we have an understanding of what a tree of life is. Then the question is, what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because now we know it's not a tree. So what, or should I say, who is it? One of my favorite books in the Bible is Zechariah. <clears throat> I love the books that teach you the hidden meaning in other books. Job is my number one. Proverbs and Isaiah are up there too. Yet we find in Zechariah another catalyst in understanding what took place in the garden. Zechariah is taken up into a vision and shown by an angel some wondrous things in the spirit realm. Zechariah 4, 11 to 14. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Zechariah is in heaven and observed two olive trees. And a seven-head lamp stand. It's called a menorah. The angel asks him what he sees. And right away, we know knowledge is about to be released according to his observation. Because anytime an angel asks you what you see, he is about to show you something. He's about to tell you something that's going to give you a revelation. Because it's, it's more in-depth than just what you're seeing. Okay? So Zechariah says that he sees these two olive trees. And he asks the angel, well, what are they? And the angel says to him, you don't know what these are? And he doesn't know. So then the angel says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. But then you have to ask the question, okay? He's seen trees. But the two anointed ones that stand by God... They're not trees. You remember when God went to visit Abraham and he had those two men with him? Those are the two anointed ones that stand by the God of this earth. But who are they? Because it never mentions it in the story of Abraham. You just know God came with two people. It was two men or they had the appearance of men but we know that they were two angels. That had took on the figure as God did. They looked like men. But it never says who they are. But does, is it in scripture? Is there somewhere in scripture. Where it gives us the understanding. Of who these two men are. Saints. I want to reiterate. That the term tree. Is a metaphor for men and angels. Okay. If you do a study through the Bible, you'll find all over scripture where God is talking about people and he's talking about trees. And we see with Daniel, when Daniel was at the river, that he was speaking to these three angels. One was on his side of the river, one was on the other side of the river, and one was standing above the waters of the river. And that's the same thing that John saw. John saw, but when John saw them, he, they, he saw them as trees because God had taken them up into a vision. And he saw a tree on this side of the river, a tree on the other side of the river, and a tree that was standing on the waters of the river. John saw three angels, but they appeared of trees. And Daniel saw three men, or three angels that appeared as men. Okay? And the Bible speaks as us being trees that are planted by the rivers of water. So with all these trees that represent angels and men, now we have to come to the understanding and conclusion that in the Garden of Eden, those were not two trees. We already know that when we eat from the tree of life, okay, that means that it's in, in, we are impregnated with the word of God. And as that word grows in us, it starts a transformation and we become trees of life our, lives ourselves and we produce fruit.
That's why that scripture linked on the saving of souls with the tree of life, with a tree of life. Okay? And that's when in Revelation that Christ says, if we overcome, we're going to give, be given access to the paradise of God. And notice how it was translated. It wasn't translated either the Garden of Eden. It was translated the paradise of God. So when you read it, as you're reading through it, you won't even see the connection of the two, that they're talking about the same thing. Because there's many people that have read Paradise of God and didn't even realize that it's talking about the Garden of Eden. So if we overcome what? We're going to be given access to eat from that tree in the garden that Adam and Eve had access to eat from, and they would live eternally. They would live forever. We have the same access to that tree. So we now know that the tree of life is the same seed that is planted in our hearts through the word of God. And if we, if we allow the process of the growth and maturing and the bearing of fruit of that tree, if we don't do anything to hinder it, if we don't do anything to kill it, if we, don't, if we keep it in an environment where it's next to the river of water, meaning the Holy Spirit is flowing through it, then we ourselves in the end will become the same trees of life. We will become the same trees producing fruit that is our destiny as the believers so then the next question is what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stay tuned <laughs>